If it is a grenade, it ain't a very good one. Good afternoon. Today's video is the Tactical Black Powder Pistol Experiment. After I posted my Tactical Black Powder Pistol 2.0 Rocking Revolvers video, I received a few interesting comments. Some were nice, some not so nice. FYI, I leave all comments up and I screenshot the truly heinous ones. I prefer to let those that are unkind show their true colors and in infamy so we know who the assholes are out there. There were some educational ones that I loved reading and some just lacking a sense of humor. Seriously, let me state again, this really isn't a tactical black powder pistol program. It's made up for obvious reasons, you know, like there are better firearms out there. I just thought the name was funny. But a couple that really stuck out were on two subjects that we're going to address today. One is me talking about the idea that the 1858 Remington black powder revolvers were the granddaddy of the mag change. Two is the dangers of leaving a loaded cylinder on the table so it could just roll off and blow up. Apparently, I have accidentally hit on a very hot topic controversial nerve in the black powder revolver world. I find this fun because being involved in the firearm space alone is just like nuts. I have likened gun blogs to mommy blogs and the idea that your opinion is never right and you're always gonna be doing it wrong. Well, guess what? The black powder world is like worse. They are like purists. Think Star Wars fans. And I love it. I am so forcing my friendship on them. Please welcome me into your fold. So someone here claimed that the cylinder change for the 1858 Remington revolver was not how the gun was originally designed. In fact, it didn't even come with an extra cylinder. Okay. Ironically, one argument of mine would be why the Remington was made to have an easier cylinder change. Whereas it wasn't sold with a spare cylinder, the 1840s Patterson Colts were. So almost 20 years before, the Remingtons later just made it easier? The Beerus could be right. There's not a lot of documentation for several years that it was designed to be used exactly for the quick cylinder change, like how Clint Eastwood did it in Pale Rider. I can go with that. But here's the foundation for my argument. I'm not claiming to be a historian, but I had a high school history teacher who was also a tunnel runner in Vietnam, and he was a rather phenomenal and inspiring teacher, so I have engorged on American war conflict ever since. So here's basically what I'm saying outside of all the rest of that. There isn't much that trumps human innovation or stupidity when they are bored. Hell, my videos here could be case in point. This was a Civil War time pistol. These soldiers, when not engaged in the Battle of Gettysburg, stitching up their clothes, losing limbs, or digging a latrine, they had some free time. They didn't have cell phones, iPads, and Atari. They had playing cards, maggot-filled hardtack, rolled cigarettes, and a campfire, and then their imagination. They were looking at their revolvers, looking at maybe what they scavenged from the battle the day before, looking at the fact that they perhaps managed to grab a few cylinders in their pile of acquired misfit goods. They put two and two together and voila. I doubt it even took three months to figure out that they needed to keep a spare loaded cylinder in a pouch. But there would be documentation, which this is arguable. But would there, really? In the form of what? It is a small thing. It wasn't war changing stuff. It would have been an FAFO at its finest. So I don't see officers riding each other in different camps. They talked about it like everyone else at the time in person. Clive had better things to write to Sarah about like the fall gourd harvest back home or smallpox. Also, this is an era of time where most people couldn't even read or write in the first place. So after more digging, I found this picture, which is really interesting. This is a gun belt for a 51 Colt owned by Confederate officer, Colonel F.S. Bass. Note the spare cylinder box on the belt. Another thing to note, the Prussian Creek Marines during the Crimean War were issued an 1851 Navy Colt with a spare cylinder and a gun belt with a holster, and guess what? A cylinder pouch. Don't worry, I cite that in the caption. A book in 1859, though not a first-hand account, however, these guys grew up with grandparents that fought in the Civil War. This states that Quantrill and his men used this technique of carrying spare loaded cylinders. We also have well-known Pony Express writer, Pony Bob Haslin, who described this practice as his own in 1860, like it was no big deal. Side note, this guy's story is really cool. At 20 years old, he holds the fastest Pony Express ride carrying President Lincoln's inaugural address from Fort Kearney in Nebraska to Fort Churchill in Utah between telegraph lines on March 4th, 1861. This was 120 miles on 13 Mustangs in eight hours after being attacked and wounded by Indians en route. He finished this with a broken jaw, five missing teeth, and an arrow wound in his arm. 20-year-old kid fighting the Wild West, 1860. The documentation that he carried loaded spare cylinders, pretty cool. 
Here's my main thing. All that aside, I have a ton of friends across all military backgrounds who have spent time in war zones that I have talked to about this subject, including three veteran brothers. The shenanigans that they get up to in their spare time is stuff for the books, or better yet, perhaps not. I'm banking on human innovation, boredom, and a little bit of stupidity for progression in this world. So the second part, the dangers of a loaded cylinder. I guess in some people's mind, this can't be the granddaddy of a mag change, but it can be the equivalent of a grenade just sitting here on the table, per this comment. Weird. So don't worry, that's exactly the basis for this experiment. I'm just gonna go off of the Remington one here because this is what I have. And this is what I talked my dad into letting me use because these things are like 90 bucks. So we use the ugly one. I am putting out a hypothesis that they are not as dangerous when dropped on the ground as some would think. Note how this kind of curves over just a little bit. I think it's more of sort of a protection. I'm sure there's a name for it. I just don't know what it is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna test this out today. I'm gonna take the cylinder and load it up with caps, black powder, and a felt wad. And we're gonna drop it and toss it a few times, six times each, because that's how many shots are in this. And I don't really have a rhyme or reason, but I needed to be mildly organized. And we are gonna do it on the normal ground, like a trail and gravel, just to be sure. Side notes. <laughs> when I was thinking through this idea of my cylinder experiment, I knew I wasn't gonna put the balls in <laughs> because it's not necessary to the experiment. I don't need the projectile. <laughs> so many jokes. I don't wanna die. I just wanna test whether there will be an explosion from being dropped or tossed. Ironically though, when I brought all this up to my dad, this conversation ensued. That what I could do is you said I couldn't throw it on the concrete, but I'm gonna toss it lightly and I'm gonna put it on the gravel and then I'm gonna do it on the grass, which is pretty much like Civil War era stuff. And you said that would be fine, right? Right, but what if we drop it and it does go off and it shoots somebody? It's not gonna shoot anybody, dad. You're not gonna put the damn ball in it. Oh. That's a good point. Also, later, when my dad brought this up to his brother, my Uncle Jim, who makes fancy AF black powder rifles, he made a comment stating, well, I guess maybe she could like throw it behind something and be safe, which I was always planning, balls in or not. But this, this is why women live longer than men. Another fun fact, I use lead balls in my video, and it is widely assumed that that was used during the Civil War. However, several archeological Civil War digs show more of a conical round versus the ball. Either way, I'm not using either one. So let's get this puppy semi-loaded and let's test my theory out. Just kidding. Okay, I got my trusty little sidekick Lila with me. And so the first comment we have was it could roll off a table and like, I don't know, explode. So that's what we're gonna test first. So we're gonna put my camera up, we're gonna take this and we're gonna knock it off. It's been loaded, pitch boop. And we're going to push it off these logs right here onto the gravel. We'll see what happens. That was one. Zero. So that was zero on the gravel. We're gonna try on the trail just by knocking it off and see what happens. Let's try it maybe instead of it this way. Let's put it this way. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Okay. We tried it this way. We tried it this way. We tried it this way. We got nothing. Um, it did dent a couple of the percussion caps. So there's that. And also we lost one, so. So now what we're getting ready to do is we're gonna throw it. So, yeah. 
Let's all take a moment and be appreciative of the fact that my dad is letting me use this for this experiment. This, this thing just is like poof. Now we're just gonna lob it and see what happens. I was oh. trying to fix it. <laughs> oh, got a little patina on it. Ah, no worries, I can fix that. <laughs> so, took this bad boy and I uh, just showed it to my dad. And um, it's pretty dinged up. So, uh, the rocks out here are flint. So, that's what's um, something interesting to note. We tried it on both normal gravel and then we also tried it on my trail. A lot of the times the percussion cap actually was dented. So that was interesting. So we had 12 times where we rolled it off, both the gravel outside and then trail. And then we had another six times where I tossed it onto the trail. We have an absolute zero that it went off. So if it is a grenade, it ain't a very good one. Damn, I know I gotta buy my dad a new cylinder.